What's Really Going On with John MacArthur, his ministries, and the Master's University and Seminary. Today, a former high-ranking administrator at the Master's Seminary gives us an inside look. Welcome to The Roy's Report, a podcast dedicated to reporting the truth and restoring the church. I'm Julie Royce, and joining me today is Dennis Swanson, a former vice president at John MacArthur's Master's Seminary. For more than 20 years, Dennis worked as an administrator there, and during his time, he oversaw operations, the library, and accreditation. He also was involved in editing the John MacArthur Study Bible, which he says John MacArthur didn't write. He also wrote a chapter in John MacArthur's book on counseling, yet Dennis's name doesn't appear anywhere in the book. But that's the tip of the iceberg of what Dennis saw and experienced. He says a woman he supervised lost her job simply because she was a woman. He says he lost his job because he and other administrators were successful in making the Master Seminary less about MacArthur and more about a quality education. Dennis also has insight into the alleged 40 hours a week that MacArthur claims he worked at the school for many years. And Dennis says the culture of fear and intimidation reported by the accrediting body that put the Master's University and Seminary on probation is real. This is going to be an eye-opening interview, and I'm so excited to dive into these topics with Dennis. But first, I'd like to thank the sponsors of this podcast, Judson University and Marquardt of Barrington. Judson is a top-ranked Christian university providing a caring community and an excellent college experience. Plus, the school offers more than 60 majors, great leadership opportunities, and strong financial aid. Judson University is shaping lives that shape the world. For more information, just go to judsonu.edu. Also, if you're looking for a quality new or used car, I highly recommend my friends at Marquardt of Barrington. Marquardt is a Buick GMC dealership where you can expect honesty, integrity, and transparency. That's because the owners there, Dan and Kurt Marquardt, are men of integrity. To check them out, just go to buyacar123.com. Well, again, joining me is Dennis Swanson, an education administrator and former vice president at the Master's Seminary. For more than two decades, Dennis worked at both the seminary and the Master's University. He started as director of innovation, then he became the librarian, then the director of accreditation, and finally the vice president of operations, library, and accreditation. So Dennis has seen a lot over the years, and I'm so pleased to have him in studio with me today. Dennis, welcome, and thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. Glad to be here. And you're in studio. You're not usually in the Chicago area. What brings you here? I'm exploring some job opportunities, and I uh, think I may be relocating to this area. And I love Chicago, so I could uh, walk around and take pictures all day. (laughs) Well, welcome to the Chicago area. If you end up uh, in this area, it'll be fun to have you here. But again, uh, we've talked quite a bit over the past year about your experience with John MacArthur, with the Master's University and Seminary. And again, you were there for over two decades. So you must have, in the early days, in the 1990s, early 2000s, enjoyed being there. Tell me what it was like in those early days. My first year, year and a half was at the college. Back then, it wasn't the university. That's a later invention. But I worked with a guy named Doug Bookman, and we worked on innovation, ideas. And so anything to make the school better, to make the programs better, to come up with new ideas, that's kind of what we explored. And at the same time, it gave me an opportunity to teach once in a while, which I always enjoyed doing. And then I was approached by Dr. Dick Mayhew, who was the dean at the seminary, and asked if I would like to come back to the seminary. I had graduated from the seminary and come and be the librarian. It was busy for the first year because I had to actually get a degree in library work. So I enrolled at San Jose State University and I finished another master's degree in two semesters. And then Dr. Mayhew again asked if I would help with accreditation. I said, sure, I'll give it a try. And And that's been a big deal, accreditation. Oh, accreditation is a huge deal. (laughs) Very big deal. And WASC, which is the Western Association of Schools and Colleges, was our regional accreditor. And they had just started a new program called Assessment Leadership Academy for Mm -hmm. leaders. And so I was in the first group of that with about 12 other people in in the region. Well, we're going to talk more about accreditation. So let's let's table that discussion because you left in 2015. In 2018 was when WASC put the master's university and seminary on probation. So part of the reason we're talking is Mm -hmm. because 
John MacArthur is in the news right now. Sure. And I have done some reporting on him. And, and so there's a lot of people asking what's really going on at the Master's University sure. and Seminary, what's really going on at Grace Community Church, at Grace to You with John MacArthur. So let me just ask you, what was it like working with John MacArthur? And, you know, what kind of president was he? Because he was the president of the, of the seminary when, when you were there. John wasn't so much for us day to day. We didn't see him a lot. John was, you, you're always wondering, you know, when he, when he would come in, it would be kind of like a whirlwind, you know, and what was he going to do today and, and what was going to happen? And you kind of just held your breath until he came and left. Hmm. You told me at one point when we were talking that you literally would go months and wouldn't see John. Oh, you could go months without seeing him. Uh, you'd see him at, you know, some events and at, certainly at graduation. But then in terms of regular meetings with the faculty in 20 years, three or four. And you said there was an annual retreat that the seminary would do? We would begin the year with a, a faculty retreat. Usually in the spring, we would have kind of end of the year dinner with everybody. Okay, so he's the president. Was he there? For the retreats, almost never. Um, for the annual dinners, he might show up, but a lot of times he didn't show for those either. And it was always you know, very busy with everything else or traveling or doing whatever it is he was doing, but it wasn't something he did very much. Part of the reason I ask is that from 2006, through 2012, if you read the 990s, which are the IRS tax forms right. that they file every year, they claimed that MacArthur was working 40 hours a week from 2006 to 2012 for six years, supposedly, and this would have been six years you were there. It says he worked 40 hours a week at the seminary. Not possible, unless he counted working at home or, or doing things. But in terms of being in the office, no, he was never there. He had a little room in the seminary building, but it was just a, a place where he could have meetings. His main office was just, you know, 50 yards away over at the church, but he didn't even have an office in the building. So as president, what was his role? Raise money. When he would speak, he would promote the school and do things like that. But in terms of an active administrative role, I, I would say he had virtually none. One of the things that has raised some eyebrows is the fact that he takes three salaries at the master's university and seminary. He was taking a salary there from 42,000 a year to 100K to 182,000 some years. Grace to you, he's taking a salary of 174,000 to, uh, you know, over 402,000. The one, the one year that he got that King James Bible that I guess was worth more than uh, 200,000 that Grace to you gifted him. Were you aware of him taking these multiple salaries at the time that you were there? No idea. Were you aware of like when he was at Grace Community Church? Was that his, considered a full-time job? Because the other ones were part-time. He'd always say that he'd spent 40 hours a week on each message they preached. After a while, you, you take that with a grain of salt. There's only so many days in the week and hours, and he couldn't be 40 hours a week at five different places or anything like that. You know, I mentioned in 2012... John MacArthur made as much as, it was over 400000 from Grace to You, gave them this salary. But it was a little bit bigger that year because he got this $200,000 King James Bible. Now, the narrative that's come out by Phil Johnson is that this Bible was given to MacArthur for, you know, as an anniversary year, and we wanted to thank him for this. But he's not a very good miser because he turned around right away and gave it away to the Master's University and Seminary. I've discovered that it doesn't show up on the 990s till four years later in 2016 is when there's a gift of a historical artifact right. to the seminary. Doesn't look like he turned around and gave it away, but you know something. In fact, you gave me, you sent me a picture, which I'll post, that shows that, what was this, 2012 is when you took that picture. Yes. And at that point, what did that note say and what does that say about the intention of John MacArthur with that Bible? We created a room, kind of a museum of rare Bibles, and we had his Bible and I created little cards for them to talk about the Bible and what it was. His Bible was a, a he Bible, which is the rarer of the two. They said it was $200,000. I might quibble that that would not be a great assessment of that in that year, but I had to put on the bottom of that card that on loan from John MacArthur. It wasn't given to the school. So you actually were told to put that note yes, there. Yes, that's how they wanted it worded, that this was on loan from Dr. MacArthur 
his personal collection or whatever it was. That was still in place in 2015 when I left. Right. It was never given to the seminary uh, that that I was aware of. It. If it when it was, I guess it was ultimately given. That was after I was gone. Well, and it was also after 2014 when these bloggers started blogging about John MacArthur's salary and what how much grace to you had paid him. Sure. His lifestyle did it raise any re- any red flags at that point? What raised the red flags was driving money to his son-in-law and and his company. When I was running operations at the seminary, I had to hire Corey Welch. I had to hire that his company to do something, but working with them was not an enjoyable experience. The end product wasn't anything to get excited about, but you know, there are certain things you didn't have a choice about. So let's talk about Corey Welch. Mm-hmm. He's John MacArthur's son-in-law, yes. as you mentioned. He was a Grace to You employee in 2008, working for about $80,000 as an employee, as the director of the television broadcasting there. Then in 2009, he started working as a video production contractor for Grace to You, getting more than $740,000 per year for doing production of Grace to You, what he had been doing before. I'm, I'm not sure. I've heard from Phil Johnson, who's the executive director of Grace to You, that that it was cost efficient to have him move into that. But I mean, if you just look at the salary he was making, right. I mean, obviously there were more costs than just his salary for production, but that's a lot of money. Yeah, well, it is. And he, he formed his own company, I guess, and mm-hmm. Welch Productions, and then continued as a contractor doing what he had been getting paid to do before. What year was this? Early 2014. We remodeled the front lobby of the of the seminary. He was contracted to make a, a video wall with big screen TVs and and produce the slideshow, which ended up being little more than a PowerPoint. I mean, I could have gotten any 20 college kids probably do the same thing. The annoying part for me was I, I continued hounding him, basically, you know, give me the specs for the computer system. We need to run this thing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, didn't do it. I'll get back to you. I'll get back to you. Finally gave me the specs. Well, they were wrong. So I ended up with a, a very nice computer that wasn't powerful enough to do what we needed to do. Had to go out and spend another, I, I couldn't return it. So it ended up spending another twelve or $15,000 on the right system which just drove the cost up for my budget, but didn't affect what we paid him. How much did you pay him? I have no idea. That part of it was off of the budget. Okay. So it was whatever he got paid, he got paid. So your impression of of Corey as the, the quality of the work that he produced, because I mean, this has been a key point that Phil Johnson has made is, hey, listen, you shouldn't have a problem with us hiring Corey Welch because he does such outstanding work. That's not my experience. My experience was adequate work, rarely on time, and kind of slowed the whole process down more than anything. I I, I was never impressed with his work. So it's interesting to me because I I just looked this up because any kind of payments to, say, a son-in-law is considered a related business transaction, should show up on the 990s. You're telling me that Corey Welch did work in 2014. Melinda Welch did some work as well. And it doesn't show up on the 990s. Their salaries and their contract was paid outside of my authority within the budget. And, and, and I ran operations, but that part of it was handled, uh, you know, oh, we'll take care of that. And it was done elsewhere. Okay. So let's talk about books. Okay. Because you were involved in a lot of the writing of these books that John MacArthur's name is on. In fact, you told me one time that John MacArthur has never actually written a book in his life. Is that right? That's my opinion. Yeah. I I know who the ghostwriters are and I know who wrote even the earliest books. He was a English professor. He was a, can't remember his name. He was a reformed Episcopal minister, but he wrote the the early books and they were sermons so, so they're taking the sermons and sort of massaging, massaging them, them and putting right. them into in some readable order and and that's kind of when phil johnson came in he did he'd been an editor i think at moody press and then he came in to do the gospel according to jesus and one thing led to another and he ghost wrote several books after that and there's another person right after that who's 
uh, Nathan Busnitz, who was the ghost wrote, he wrote books out of whole cloth. I wasn't, there was no ser underlying sermon series behind it. You're saying there's no part of it that was John mm -hmm. MacArthur? Other than maybe him looking at it and saying, yeah, that looks good. You weren't involved firsthand in those other books, but you were in the MacArthur Study Bible? We got a, different sections of, uh, assigned to us, different books of the Bible, and we'd create notes. And then Dick Mayhew would edit them and put them together. And then, I mean, the, the, the process was supposed to be then, then John carefully looked at each one and, you know, changed the wording to, and that was not what I saw. What did you see? I saw him appear every other week or so for a half hour, 45 minutes in this little room where, where Dick had taken a little conference room and created the whole where the study Bible is produced. The study Bible, in my view, was 80% Dick Mayhew taking the stuff that the seminary had created, re-editing it, and, and John doing something. But I mean, the idea that he looked at every single note and, and checked them all, I, I, I rather doubt that happened. Is that unusual, though, in the publishing business? I guess for big name authors and things like that, it might not be unusual. I question it ethically at a certain level. If everyone thinks you did this and you really didn't, and you don't really do anything to dissuade people of that fact, I mean, it took a lot of work. And um, you can't write a note on every single verse and you have to figure out what's what and then go through and, and then all of us had our own expertise in different areas and we would look and, you know, what would be something useful in this area. So did you write a portion of it? I, I re redid a lot of the notes in uh, Proverbs that had to be taken a look at. And I over, I, I went through and checked the notes for, I used to teach the archaeology class. So I checked the notes on archaeology and suggested a few here and there that, mm -hmm. that occurred. And, you know, some of them were there. You did actually write a chapter though, as I understand, in a counseling book. Yeah. There were three books in a series that um, I think Word ended up publishing them. That One was the um, a book on preaching, uh, another one was on pastoral ministry, and then there was a book on counseling. And um, a guy named Wayne Mack, who was the professor of counseling at the college at the time, was kind of the, the lead editor. It was one of those John MacArthur, you know, Wayne Mack, and the college faculty, just like the preaching book was the seminary faculty. I did uh, a lot of the editing, just, you know, proofreading and things like that. And then I did one chapter where I compiled it. It was a frequently asked question chapter. I wrote some of the answers and a lot of the contributors answered it as well. And it came out and it was well done. It was well received. I think they still use it as a textbook. And then, oh, about two years later, the book was being reissued. I think they, they tinkered with the title. I think they changed all of the titles of those slightly and reissued them. And when the new one came out, and I'm working in the library, so I see a lot of the new books. And so, oh, the new counseling book came out. And I said, oh, let me look at it. And I'm skimming through it. And I come to the chapter that I had done, and my name wasn't there anymore. It was now John MacArthur. Just like that? Just like that. I uh, complained a little bit, but it was already printed. What were they going to do? And I never got a, any kind of explanation as to why that was done or who did it or anything else. It just, my name disappeared. And did you get royalties? No, the contributors all got a stipend to originally produce whatever it is they produced. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, and who paid the stipend? Oh, gosh, I think the check to me came from the, the school. From the school. Yeah. So I guess the question is, and, and we don't know the answer to this question, but there's this whole issue of intellectual property and who owns what. Right. If you were paid by the master's university, then they should own that intellectual property of the book and whether or not John got royalties on that or not. And I guess we don't know. All we know is that Phil Johnson recently said that John MacArthur makes millions in royalties. I'm certain he does. Mm. You did tell me about a project, though, while you were there, this hymnal project. Oh, gosh, and, yeah. and Grace to You, as I understand it, would buy tons of copies of books, and that would often put them on... The bestseller list, if sure. they were bought, were they bought through Amazon? I just assumed they would get them as uh, from the directly from the publisher. So I don't know how they uh, accounted for that. So if you do get it directly from the publisher, it doesn't count for your sales. And you do get it at a fraction of the cost. Right. And, and I'm sure that's what they did for a lot of them. I, and I, I would hope so. Grace to you use them as giveaways and different things. But it was, it always struck me odd, you know, we, we couldn't find a hymnal we like, so we created our own. 
they're working on a Bible translation now. We don't like the legacy Bible. Legacy Bible. We yeah. don't like. We don't have any. There's no Bibles we like, so we're going to create our own. Well, and they said they have six people um, that have been working for a year to translate the Bible. Well, that's it's impossible. That's just silly. There, that's an old New American Standard that they're tinkering with the wording, and that's all. It's I've seen the sample that they've just put up on the web page, and that's all it is. It's not what the King James took all those guys, you know. 13 years to produce. The NASB originally, I think, took seven or eight years of 40 people working on it. The idea that six people working a year are going to create a whole new Bible translation is just absurd. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I don't see the point in it. Why do you have to create something that's already done? Let's talk accreditation because that's something that you you worked on mm -hmm. and from discussing this with you, and I don't know anything to the contrary of this, in 2008, the school was doing great. And then you went from great accreditation in 2008 to being on probation in 2018, which was three years after you left. Mm -hmm. But one of the things, and I've read the report, the WASC report, which is the accrediting body, and one of the things that they really highlight is what they said was a culture of fear and intimidation at the school. And that they seem to have tied that directly to MacArthur. Yeah. They also complained that he was not working full time at the school and for a school that size and what needs to be done with accreditation, and everything else, it needs a full time administrator at sure. the top. So, I mean, talk about that. Did you feel a culture of fear and intimidation? To a degree. There was a, a colleague that, uh, Dr. Andy Snyder, who was fired, despite the fact that he was universally loved by all of the faculty, he was not loved by Phil Johnson. And that was common knowledge, that that was where the attack was coming from over some arcane theological issue, frankly. But probably starting about 2012, and that's when it really began to get difficult you walked around kind of on eggshells sometimes wondering what in the world was going on. There were changes. I remember Dr. MacArthur got, they started getting rid of, he got rid of his secretary who had been there for, had been the secretary for like 25 years. And because they were, they were moving female employees out. Why? Why were they moving female employees out? I have no idea. It just, I remember that uh, there was one person that worked for me in the library, my circulation manager. She was the only woman left in the school, the, the seminary side, who had authority over men, you know, the student workers. That wasn't okay? Apparently not, because they fired her. Just for uh, being a woman? I, I don't know exactly why they fired her, but that was mainly the reason. Mm -hmm. And um, it was done poorly enough that she sued and, and won. And I think they settled out of court, but there was a judgment against the school at that point. And it was just... They tried to run the school like it was the church. Hmm. And they're separate entities. They have separate missions. They have different guidelines. They have all sorts of different ways of doing things. And, and you can't run a school like you run a church. Mm -hmm. And it became problematic. You know, they withdrew from the Evangelical Council on Financial Accountability. And they've had trouble since I left with WASP, the accreditors. It's like they don't want any outside entity holding them to the basics of professionalism and standards and, and either in higher education or financial dealings or anything like that. The master's university and seminary is accredited by ECFA the, now. The schools are. I think the church withdrew. The church withdrew. Yeah. Exactly. And that's recent, though. Yeah, that's fairly recent. And, and, you know, at what point will the schools withdraw? I mean, it's a very inward growing isolation. I mean, we have to have our own hymnal. We're going to have our own Bible. We have our own school. We're, you know, we're going to watch it ourselves. It's becoming very insular. In terms of education, that's very worrisome. I was looking at the list of faculty for the seminary now, and it's, it's mostly people that graduated from there. It's a large number who are, they got all their degrees there. And, and that's not the way education is supposed to work. I don't mean to be inflammatory, mm -hmm. but to use this word will sound inflammatory. And, and I'm only asking because a number of people I've talked to who have come from either the Masters or Grace Community Church seem to be afraid to speak on the record, a lot of them. Sure. But they describe it as cult-like. Now, I know one of the characteristics of a cult is it has to teach bad doctrine. And, and I don't no, think you can... necessarily. 
Well, I've, I've yeah. heard that it's not just the control, but usually sure. when it's called a cult, it, it has that other element. Right. And, and I don't think that could possibly oh, no. be said of, of MacArthur. Although some people would, they have this whole controversy of Mark of the Beast, and we're not going to get into that. But, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't see any glaring issues. In fact, I have appreciated John MacArthur's preaching. Oh, In fact, absolutely. little known fact that when I was reporting on Harvest Bible Chapel, people were circulating a John MacArthur sermon on 1 Timothy 5.20 mm -hmm. about publicly exposing an elder who's sinning because sure. he preaches very straight up on that and mm -hmm. hardly anybody preaches on that. And so I, I actually appreciate a lot of the preaching of John MacArthur, but this control and fear that I've seen from people who mm -hmm. I've had numerous people really upset about things that are going on and they'll talk to me, but they won't go on the record and I'm like, why? You, you don't go to the church anymore. You're not at the school anymore. And they're like, you don't understand. I'll be ostracized yes. by everyone. Tell me about that dynamic. They often can't just get rid of people. You know, they have to trash their reputation on the way out. It's like this recent deal with Dr. Horn being dismissed. Let me just say, because some people listening might not know, but Dr. Sam Horn was brought in less than a year ago mm -hmm. to be president of the school because one of the things when they were put on probation by WASC, mm -hmm. one of these issues, again, was John MacArthur serving as president. So he moved to chancellor and they brought in a full-time president, which right. was Sam Horn. And Sam, from my understanding, had a stellar reputation at that point. A great guy, a great uh, experienced educator, school administrator, upfront guy. I, I, you know, I have all the respect in the world for him. I've met him a few times, I, but I have other friends who've known him for 30, 40 years mm -hmm. and um, who were all just outraged. I mean, first of all, you hire somebody and then who you announce to the world, he's the, he's the guy, this is going to be our leader going forward. And nine months later, you're letting him go. I mean, you're, you're, he resigned, you, he's forced out, I'm sure. And four board members are leaving at the same time. You know, so that really something. hasn't been reported yet because right. I can't get anybody to talk to me again. Right. And, and that's a shame. And, and there's the thing about talking is not only ostracizing, but there, there are a lot of people, they believe in the greater good. Yeah. MacArthur's got his flaws and all of these things and these things have happened, but you know, if, if we attack him or if we expose this, you know, it's going to hurt the whole cause of Christ. And so Christianity is going to rise and fall on that. And I, I, I don't believe that. I believe in holding people accountable, and if it needs to be called out, it needs to be called out. And and what are they? Gonna, they've already fired me. What else are they? What else? I mean, <laughs> I'm I'm sure they'll come up with some you know horrible stories about me. You know what well, a I terrible mean, person I was or something. But that's I've been gone for six years. I mean, it, it's what offends me is how they hurt people on the way out. The poor guy that replaced me in the library. I mean, he lasted for six months, and then they fired him too. And um, the lady who worked for me, who they fired and, and she at least got some, you know, financial compensation. But, and with Sam, not, I mean, just letting him go, but then going to chapel to students and saying he has anger issues and all of these terrible things, you know. And this, by the way, this is on my website. If you mm -hmm. go to Julie Roy's, R-O-Y-S dot com, there's a story about Dr. Sam Horn resigning, but I also was given, somebody had recorded the chapel that you're talking about and Dr. Abner Chow got up in front of chapel and he essentially said there's qualifications for an elder and some of these is that he can't be pugnacious can't be given to outbursts of anger and now we want this just to stay with us <laughs> that's what killed me it's like i'm going to say this i'm going to spread this to hundreds of people in a chapel yeah maybe more than hundreds maybe i don't know how many what's a student body at oh my, there might have been four or five hundred there four or five hundred and he said this applied to sam horn which was shocking apparently to those who knew him because they're like, this is a man who's proven character. We know this has never happened before. And why he left, maybe you have some insight on that. I'm certainly not getting anything from the school, anything official. Oh, no. And first of all, I mean, I'm not an attorney, but I know something about the HR rules and what Dr. Chow did was probably actionable. I mean, it, it's slanderous. It, it affects his ability perhaps to get other employment down the road. What somebody else told me, I mean, the first that Dr. Horn knew about this is when he heard the recording and, and was horrified, and rightfully so. And no small coincidence that Dr. Chow has now been appointed the interim president. I mean, it's 
some of the strangest, you, you couldn't write a novel with these twists and turns and, and have it make any sense. Well, it'll be interesting to see what happens, whether the master's university and seminary will stay together or be split. I heard that was part of the discussion. Whether John MacArthur will take over as president of one of those, probably the seminary, if if any, but at this point, we don't know. No, and I mean, that's the rumor I've heard, that they want to make the seminary a ministry of the church, separate it from the college, and put it under the control of the elders. That's John's get, baby, the yeah, seminary. Get rid of, take them out from under oversight of WASC. Which means they, if you're not accredited, you can't get loans, right? Well, the, the, the students couldn't get student loans. People who were thinking about going into the military chaplaincy or other mm-hmm. things like they couldn't get their degree there because those those agencies require uh, what about an accredited schools? degree. Like if you're getting a teacher certificate, can you do that if you're not accredited? Not Probably necessarily. Not. I mean, yeah. it, you, you end up having to explain it. And, or if you transfer you know, your unaccredited degree and try to go get a PhD somewhere, it, I mean, it can be done, but it's it's just a lot of extra work. And frankly, you can't just pick up the phone and call and say, well, we're not with you anymore and we're going to split the schools. There is a, a thing called the substantive change report that mm-hmm. needs to be done mm-hmm. ahead of time. And it's not just a one-page letter that says, you know, this is what we're going to do. (laughs) You've done these. Yeah, I've done these before. There's an enormous amount of work that has to go into this. And you can't just, because if you split, I mean, the church treasurer will take care of the finances and the HR department will take care of all those things. But there's a lot of stuff that goes on with that. They think perhaps they're going to go to ATS, the Association of Theological Schools, to get accreditation. Well, that's a two or three year undertaking. And ATS is a great organization and a great accreditor. They don't cut corners. Hmm. I will be very surprised to see what comes out of that. Sure. Well, let's talk about your dismissal, because as I understand, it came to an abrupt end in April 2015. That's when you got fired. However, this all began with a survey Tell me about that survey and the process and why it came to a head like it did. If I was chronicling this, I chronicle the beginning of the end, April 2014. We had a, we, we, every year the seminary faculty had a dinner and um, nice restaurant. We did it every year. It was fun. It was in the evening. It was a Monday. John came to it. MacArthur came to it. He was late. He was obviously in a surly, disagreeable mood. And he got up and, and in front of faculty, wives and different staff members and, and started off by saying, you know, the, you guys, teach, you're doing a great job. I'm proud of you. You're doing wonderful. It's, it's all, but your leaders have just stabbed you in the back. You know, they, they've just undercutting everything you're trying to do. And, we're, and everyone's looking around at each other saying, what in the world is this Because this about? is supposed to be a nice banquet. Yeah, it's supposed right? to be a nice banquet. <laughs> this is not where you and get that kind of And he goes on and he just continues to lambast. And they're, basically the, and the leadership was there were four people. There's Dr. Mayhew, Dr. Busnitz, myself, and a guy named Ray Maringer who was in charge of admissions and different things. And it turned out what he was upset about, apparently, was we had begun to really work on why do students come to Master Seminary? Mm-hmm. John was in his middle 70s at the time. We all understood he was not going to live forever. We would do surveys of income. Why did you come here? And the number one reason constantly was, you know, John MacArthur. I mm-hmm. want to come and study under John MacArthur, which he'd preach in chapel once in a while, but he didn't teach classes or anything like that. And we realized that's not sustainable when he's not here. So we had just earlier before this dinner had a new survey and we had what we thought was success. The number one reason students were coming to the seminary was the reputation of the school. And then it was, you know, the faculty and the academic programs. And there was something else. And, and John MacArthur, as the reason people were coming to the seminary was like number five. And this was new. This yeah, had never happened. This before. had never happened before. And, and so we were happy. We, we thought we had accomplished. We were, we were building for the future. He was apparently patently upset. I went straight from that dinner to LAX because I was flying to somewhere for a conference and I didn't get back in the town until Thursday. And I went in the next morning. First thing I went to Dr. Mayu's office when he got there and I just said, I, you know, I just want to, I, I think we, you're doing a great job. I think this is exactly what we're trying to do. And he was, I could tell he was just utterly defeated. He just said, well, it is what it is. He was gone by fall. He had been replaced. And they they dress it up. They said, well, he's going to retire. He's going to become this research professor. Well, 
they moved him to a little office. It didn't last. They, we, we did an annual lecture series, and this was something Dick had thought up, and it was very well received over the years. And they renamed it, you know, the Dick Mayhew Lecture Series. Well, apparently it that lasted about a year and a half or two, maybe one year after that, and they canceled. They don't do the series anymore. It's not even listed on the webpage anymore. It's just gone. Hmm. So it was like, like they've erased everything related to him. And then um, the following April, then I was, it was a holiday. I got called in and said, we're reorganizing and you're not needed anymore. I've been there for almost 25 years. Mm -hmm. And I, I said, that's fine. But what, I, I really want to talk to John personally about this. I mean, I, I think I've earned the right to, to have a conversation with the president over this. And, and I was told that, no, no, he's not interested in talking to you. And that was it. I was given a, a little bit of a severance, but it was, I was not like I was planning to go look for a job at the time, but it was Monday. It was a holiday. I had my office cleaned out by Wednesday mm -hmm. and I was gone. I wasn't allowed to tell my staff. I wasn't allowed to meet with anybody. You're like so, persona non grata. Yeah, I was just persona like non grata. And it was, you know, if, if you want to talk about fear and intimidation, well, my staff was just devastated. People, you know, students, otherwise, you know, what in the world is going on? Fortunately, I wasn't teaching that semester or mm -hmm. that could have been even more problematic. But apparently I was wanted by somebody. I became the dean of the library in the University of North Carolina system and um, had been there for the last five or six years. So... You had said that other people who had left, that their character was essentially assassinated mm -hmm. as they were going out the door. Did this happen to you? Yeah. I mean, there were a lot of various rumors and, and, and innuendos that were put out. And, and I think they did have some sort of staff meeting where they said, well, you know, the reason Dennis is gone is this reorganization. And, and we just, you know, we, we couldn't afford to pay him just to be the librarian anymore. And we were going to go, you know, the funny thing is they didn't give me a choice. It's not like, well, would you take just a pay cut to keep being the librarian? And you don't, we're, we don't want you to do accreditation or operations anymore. I and mean, that was never an option. Mm -hmm. and, and to your knowledge, you, you don't know anything that you did that put you out of his good graces? No. One thing that was told that kept being repeated was, you were too close with Dr. Mayhew. You were too much like him, and you were trying to run things the same way he ran things, mm. as though that was a bad thing. Hmm. And I know as an administrator and or a professor, often you don't have a lot of contact with the board, but I know when there's issues, they say you look at the board. Mm -hmm. And I know one of the things that came up in, again, this WASC report that was three years after you left was that the board was not independent. Almost everybody was good friends with MacArthur. They were, you know, or pastors at Grace Community Church. I mean, right. did you feel like you had any recourse that you could go to the board? What was the board like? The board was exactly as WASC described. And it's interesting. I, I created a memo a couple months before I was gone, like January, February, because we were getting ready for a new cycle of accreditation. I said, these are the, these are the things we need to work on. I said, this is getting too insular mm -hmm. and, and we're going to run into problems. We, we need to stay ahead of this. And, and when they were put on probation uh, in 2018, almost verbatim, almost everything I wrote in that memo was one of the things that they talked about. Mm. Um, I'm glad they got off probation. I love the school. It's a good school. It has a lot of potential. It's been mismanaged, I think, the last five or seven years. One of the things in the report, though, that we haven't talked about is some of the Clery Act and mm -hmm. Title IX violations that supposedly were in there of women who say they were sexually assaulted when they were at the school. They tried to report it, and not only did they not find comfort or protection or help at the school, but that they felt like the administration actually turned on them. Sure. Do you have any firsthand knowledge of any of that? Most of those occurrences were at the college. Mm -hmm. So with the female students mm -hmm. and, and things like that, obviously the one person that worked for me that was fired and then mm -hmm. sued, I don't know what all of that was about, but since she won, I assume that the judge thought that she was right. Mm -hmm. It was a disturbing trend. I mentioned the fact that Dr. MacArthur got rid of his secretary at the church who'd been like 25 years and you know, she still needed to work. Um, the, the turnover and the women's place was in the home and not in ministry and not even in supporting ministry, not even working. It was like, we don't want women to work at all. And, and, we're, and we believe that so strongly, we're just not going to hire any women. 
I, I found that to be disturbing at, at a lot of levels. I mean, should women be pastors? You know, I, I, I personally think the Bible is clear on that. But at the same time, there's lots of things women can be involved in. Mm-hmm. It's another story, but all the, the Beth Moore stuff and, and all the things that, that he said about her, it was just, it's just inappropriate. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a way to express your being on the other side of an argument than pejorative sorts of uh, comments like that. Well, I've seen plenty of pejorative. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, we all have. It's, 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 and that's the, and, the, and that may be the thing that that upsets me the most about what's happening at the school is the trashing of reputations. I, I remember when when uh, my good friend Dr. Larry Pettigrew taught theology there for a long time, and he was moving to uh, become dean at um, Shepherd Seminary in Cary, mm-hmm. Indiana. Well, and and, and MacArthur said um, in public. You know, well, you know, Larry Pettigrew is out of the will of God. And, it's, you know, you, you know, it wasn't he wasn't kidding, which reminds me of, if I can wow. tell you another story. We were we were in a WASC meeting we were, it was a conference call. Dr. MacArthur was there and myself and two other people from the college were there and WASC was on the phone and they were asking pointed questions. And they asked, one of the questions they asked was about, you know, you don't have any minority representation on on the board, and and that's true. It, it there is there are no women, there are no, um, and there are no minorities on the board. And and John, with a completely straight face, and he was dead serious. I was sta- I was sitting like we're sitting right now. I was looking right at him, and he said, "We do have minorities on the board. We have a Dutchman." <laughs> and 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 I'm I looked over at the the. The wow. vice president over the college was a friend of mine, and we looked at each other. And he says, "Yeah, we have." And MacArthur continued, "We have, you know, John Van Wingerton. You know, he's a, he's a Dutchman. He's not he's not an American. You know." And we I'm, were, I'm dumbfounded. Well, I we were all we all were, and 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 it wasn't he wasn't making a joke. It wasn't lighthearted, you know. And and the people uh, at, at the Wask office who are on the other end of the call, I could I could almost imagine their faces. They were just you know dumbfounded. Well, they just kind of politely moved on to the next thing. They didn't even know how to respond to that. I mean, that is a show of how insular it's become mm-hmm. when you don't even know that your your opinion is so completely out of step with the conventional wisdom on things. I mean, that's right. that's stunning. But when you talk about people's character being assassinated, pejorative comments, I, I will say I have never in my life, and I've been reporting for a while, never been called or treated by a ministry director, the way that Phil Johnson has treated me and the things that he has said about me. It is shocking to me that he remains in that position with his behavior. Um, But I'll say even more than that. I didn't even know this, but a whole army of YouTubers out there that defend John and just vilify anybody who dares to publish anything that might possibly be negative about John. And they say things that are just flat out false. I mean, it's such a twisting of the truth or such a pulling things out of context. I've never received the kind of hate mail I'm getting now. The names I am called, the middle finger emojis. I mean, there's nothing godly about it. Oh, no, not at all. It's unbelievable to me. It's like a mafia. I don't get any of it. There's nothing Christian about the way they deal with people who don't agree with them. When the school was put on probation by WASC, MacArthur went to the spoken chapel and he said, you know, this is a, an organized satanic attack. Right. No, it wasn't. You need to get your house in order. It's not just a difference of opinion. It, mm-hmm. it's, a, it's an attack or it's a satanic attack or it's mm-hmm. an organized, orchestrated attack on, on truth. The same thing happened to Austin Doucette, who was the seminary student who spoke out about these COVID guidelines that sure. TMUS had themselves. That was their guidelines that they were flagrantly violating and how he was being balked by professors because he was wearing a mask, these things. And he showed the conversation that was going on in this kind of a, a private uh, social media that they had at the seminary. And they were saying, pray for Austin's salvation. Yeah. If you don't agree with them, you must be evil or you're, you're just not saved. And, and all those things have been said about me. Hmm. It's really too bad because the schools had really good people, hmm. really knowledgeable people, broad thinking people who could really make the, the schools shine much more than they have. I don't know what the future holds. Hmm. You said it's a good school. They have great people there. At the same time, we've got this really toxic culture, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. 
Can it change? And if so, what needs to happen? I think the college perhaps is salvageable if, if the right person comes in to lead. If they split and the seminary becomes a ministry of the church, it, it'll, John's what, 81 or 82? What happens when he dies? Anyone who would want to succeed him at the church, I would question their mental stability <laughs> at a certain level. Um, I, you know, but what happens? Who's going to, who's being groomed to take over? Mm. No one that I'm aware of. Um, I really don't know what's going to happen. And, mm. and if the accrediting people, you know, drop the hammer on the whole thing and ultimately the college is going to suffer, things could be bad. Mm. So I don't know what the future holds. I think it's very, very shaky right now. What, what could they do to change? They should have allowed Sam Horn to continue what he was doing as the president. I think he had some good ideas. Somebody, him or somebody like him, a, a reworking of the board to get some independent thinking mm -hmm. and move on from there. And an end of cult of personality? I think so. It can't be everything related to one person. Yeah. Well, Dennis, we could talk a long time about this, but I have enjoyed our conversation and I've enjoyed the, the inside look to this. And I wish you the best thank as, you. as you're job searching here and, and maybe we'll end up in the Chicago area. But thank you for taking the time. I appreciate it. Thank you. And I appreciate all the work that you're doing and, and the reporting. I've, I've enjoyed uh, seeing all of the, uh, the comments as well and uh, pray for you regularly that thank the you. truth always wins. That's what I've always believed and taught. And, and truth and the right thing always comes out on top. It may just take a while. Oh, well, thank you. And I, I, I do appreciate that. And I do believe that, that the truth does win out in the end. And so we just hold to that. Uh, again, thank you so much for listening to The Roy's Report, a podcast dedicated to reporting the truth and restoring the church. I'm Julie Royce. If you'd like to find me online, just go to Julie Royce, spelled R-O-Y-S dot com. And please subscribe to The Roy's Report on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts. That way you'll never miss an episode. And I'd really appreciate it if you'd help us spread the word about the podcast by leaving a review. And then please share the podcast on social media so more people can hear about this great content. Again, thanks so much for joining me today. Hope you have a great day and God bless. Mm -hmm.